uh, person of the educational field. In education, I mean primary and secondary and vocational education, not uh, university education, not uh, education for uh, companies. So I'm interested in learning and e-learning in traditional schools, in institutions that, unlike the, the UOC, have not been specifically created to foster and to deliver new, new forms of learning. I must say that I'm not an academic, I'm not a researcher, so I feel free to say things without much rigor, so I hope you will apologize me if I say something which is not fully appropriate or it's not the state of the art, I'm certain about that. I will try to convey you just some thoughts, some impressions, which are based on my lifelong experience with the educational system that began many years ago when I was a school student. And by the way, I was not very comfortable with the education that we had at that time. So the experience is large and <laughs> are not always satisfactory. Yes, uh, I, I would like to recall the aims of the seminar as uh, they are specified in the, in the brochure. Eh? So the, the seminar is uh, tried, uh, has to, to, to consider aspects of the future challenge for the use of e-learning in different contexts. Uh, and then uh, take into account the technological and above all the educational challenges. Well, uh, e-learning, to start, is not a very clear concept. It's a concept that has arisen in some moment in history, but it's not very clear. And in fact, the schools never talk about e-learning. So they, they, they talk about ECT or something like that. And then the contexts are learning contexts absolutely different from a company, from a university, a traditional university, a school, a kindergarten, and so on. So educational challenges are not as straightforward. They are very very different, and that uh, depend on the DMs of the organization, the culture of the organization, the way the organizations are managed, their social function, and so on. So the scope is really, really huge, the scope, the one that is in the seminar. So here I come to this, this, this young boy. Certainly, uh, uh, now we are in a time and we have to confront a very widespread use of uh, access to interactive devices which has no historical uh, precedent. He's a boy, a very small boy. Uh, obviously, he is a boy of the, we can call it the digital generation. It's, they deserve this title. <laughs> I don't know want to say X generation or digital, or it's digital, because they are playing with the uh, digital devices. Obviously, he is learning all the time. Uh, he is learning with uh, educational, with uh, electronic means. So is this boy a learner? I think that we can say that truly this boy is an uh, e-learner because he's learning using electronic means and other means, but obviously this is uh, part of this, uh, his uh, ecological environment, the environment in which he is developing. So uh, we have back here the, the children which are a little bit uh, grown up. Huh? They are uh, using mobile devices which are absolutely everywhere. Uh, so there's these activities that uh, playing games, sending messages, uh, surfing the web, watching videos, creating uh, content, posting content, searching for information, exploring the world of information, simulated environments. All these falls under the, the level of uh, e-learning. Uh, e In my opinion, yes, this is truly learning because it has to, to do with learning, the activities that can be for other uh, purposes, but they bring types of learning, so I think that e-learning should be, at least for this uh, type of youngsters, in, uh, should include this, uh, the, the concept of e-learning should include this, the activities that they are doing. Now, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this teenager, this, uh, this uh, girl is uh, probably more comfortable using technology than many adults, than many teachers that talk about e-learning. Uh, so he is very natural uh, user of that. Maybe she's uh, listening to music, maybe she's uh, listening to a podcast. So um, I think that you can truly say that she is an e-learner. So I think we have to revamp the concept of e-learning eh? or maybe to, to drop out the, the e letter because it is simply learning. So here we have a, 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 a point that I wanted to raise. I will come back to the, the aims of the seminar and uh, I said, well, this is very okay. It's, it's clear, that, but what about this one? Management challenge. Because education is activity which, activity which is managed, and the managed are not here. managers are not here usually. The managers do not attend conferences. The people who are on the levers of the system, 
they do not attend do not attend conferences. They are in the in their office. They are in their maybe in the parliament or in other places. But they are not here, so they do not participate, and they are fully unaware of what is taking place in these places in which we try to improve the educational system, the improve the learning, and so on. But usually the managers are not here. Well, sometimes there are low-level managers. If I say a headmaster of a principal of a secondary or a primary school, is certainly a manager here. But if he's a politician or a technical people that uh, uh, governs the, the, the technology that uh, manages the technology that is used in the university or in the educational system, if you are a parliamentarian or a uh, a high-ranking official of the ministry, you usually do not attend this type of conference, maybe in some cases, but in a separate way. They do not participate in the problems of the educational problem. And we are a little bit, I think, so, a little bit blind because we try to focus much on what the teachers and what the practitioners can do without eh, uh, looking at the other side of the coin as the, the people who manage the, the, the activities that are taking place in the schools and in the educational system. And these people are the people who influence the goals, the processes, the budgets, the, that set the instructions, the educational relationships, that uh, define uh, teacher education, the amount of the and deployment of resources. Everything depends on the managers, not on the teachers. But these people do not participate in e-learning conference or conference. So I think we are seriously biased, and probably what we are going to do is not very much profitable because the ones who are in the command places do not participate in this. In this general trade in the general moon of improving education. So I think we should <laughs> make uh, some seminars or activities aimed at managers, even politicians, because uh, we need certainly to involve them, because without them, I think anything, re any real change, is not, uh, real change is not possible. Uh, E-learning has a myriad of worlds. I just put here one, it's clear that there is an e-learning for the world of business, there is e-learning for the open and distance learning universities, there is e-learning in uh, traditional universities, are uh, learning uh, obviously in uh, schools. But if I come to the, the origin of the term, the origin of the term is probably at this time of the early 90s, early 2000, uh, 10 years or 12 years ago, in which this gentleman, for instance, as an example, the, the, the CEO of Cisco Systems said that e-learning is the next major killer application. Luckily, we are still alive, but uh, but the, it means that from from the point of from the uh, stock, market, stock market point of view, this industry began to exist uh, 10, 12, 13, 15 years ago. But that began that we are creating an industry which is new, which is trying to deliver training to companies uh, uh, in order to attain certain objectives. And also this uh, type of technology, this type of processes can be applied to traditional settings of education. Putting the, the, the label uh, was easy, was really easy because we had the email and it had, this had a very popular hold. So then uh, many terms uh, popped out, e-government, e-business, e-procurement. And what does this mean? That there are two things of doing things. You can do government or you can do it e government. You can do business or doing e business. You can do learning or you're learning. It's a, a dichotomy, a separation, which I think is now has no, no sense. But at that time, it appeared that you could uh, have a, an activity that's uh, e commerce and consider that e commerce was something like separate of the normal commerce. Certainly because it used technology, but nevertheless, we know that it's commerce. So my point, my point is here that e learning is doomed to disappear as a concept, and we will talk sometime in the future of learning, unless we use this in order to label a specific industry which is based on certain activities that works with certain aims. For instance, delivering just-in-time knowledge and training at the desktop, facilitating the adaptation to changing educational environment, uh, to changing environments and updating the, the workforce skills. Also, uh, trying to avoid interferences with the working time and obviously to reduce training costs. So we have that learning has full sense when you have these aims or <coughs> this type of aims in mind. So here we have a very top-down uh, industry uh, which has to uh, it has been developed in order to, to satisfy certain needs. I don't know if these needs can match exactly what the needs we have in education, because the top-down industry, uh, 
it's, it's, it can work very beautifully, very perfectly. It's only for a certain uh, type of, the, of objectives. Obviously, the industry exists with the material elements. I'm not going to, 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 to talk about them, but certainly there is contents, textbook publishers, corporate training providers, educational software, content providers. We have an industry of software itself, platforms, uh, virtual learning environments. When there is an economic model, users, a paper course, paper uh, paper user, free courses, etc. And there are many, many possibilities. We have a, a large uh, issue of the, the rights, the rights of the faculties, the rights of the, the companies. I don't have this. Uh, privacy, security, and ways of delivering and using support. So here we have the components of an industry, which is an industry very reasonable in itself. And it has to work in order to attain certain means. But I'm not absolutely certain if this industry is the industry that can serve education as well. I don't know. Because when arriving in, uh, to a learning in schools, uh, I, I, obviously there are institutions, schools are institutions that were not designed for relearning, but they are undergoing, like the, the, uh, the rest of the society, a process of uh, going digital. But the clients of the schools are young people. Our young people, the young learners which are in the school, first, they have limited capabilities of the independent study and of setting long-term goals. You could think that university students uh, or people who are retraining uh, their 30s and their 40s and so on, they have these uh, strong capabilities of independent study. But this is not true for uh, uh, a 10-year-old, for instance, or a 15-year-old. Even higher school students do not have the maturity characteristics that can be expected from a uh, of a university student. So uh, here we have uh, an important difference. Then uh, another one is that the, 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 the youngsters uh, learn, obviously, using technology, but also interacting with classmates, with teachers, and other people. And these young learners need to be continuously stimulated, monitored, and supported by physically present teachers, which is one of the functional functions of the schooling. So I think that schooling is going to, to, to resist a long time because the need of ha having teachers there physically present in order to stimulate, to support, uh, to, to give advice, and so on, is absolutely uh, necessary. And this is very difficult to, to, to deliver this uh, in an electronic, by electronic systems. So, uh, obviously, uh, children are not in the business of just-in-time uh, just learning for retraining and skilling. This is another area. So, uh, schools have a, a very specific set of characteristics that uh, have to be taken into account if we try to, to foster uh, learning using learning means uh, in order to uh, attain the general educational goals. These people, obviously, they do not talk about learning. They use technology. No? They do not talk about ICT. ICT is, the ICT is there, so there is no need to refer to, to the concept. So uh, they know they are just simply natural users, and which is maybe not so natural is the this classroom setting in which they are fixed and the way they have to, to to use the devices in a way in which the, maybe it's not fully natural. But that depends on the way education is managed, and I will come back to this later. So, on the, uh, on the, on the whole, uh, we have a set of aims of ICT in the schools. Schools are embarked in massively in, uh, in, in the process of implementing and assessing ways of accommodating ICT uh, in order to improve the teaching, uh, to use it as productive tools, to support skills development, and also, in some cases, even to foster constructivist approaches to learning, but this is, this is not the general, the general norm. But nevertheless, schools are embarked and teachers train and retrain in order to, to use technology to uh, satisfy this, this, these requirements. But nevertheless, the education, they use a bottom-up approach because teachers want to feel free. They need to feel free because there is no other way to do, do in the job. So in general, they are working in the way they consider they should work. So in that sense, I said that I say that this is a bottom-up approach. Well, but the school based education and learning is defined by some specific characteristics, which are essentially managerial characteristics. The one I can call it closure, uh, closed organizational space, the content, the curriculum, the times, the hours, set, all these things. The closed physical space, 
Obviously, the school has a self-regarding functions. It's got custody functions. So, it's obviously, a closed space. The closed information space was the norm until very recently, and now the technologies are breaking this structural pillar of the education. But nevertheless, many teachers and many institutions, I, the governments with, uh, with uh, uh, exam systems, uh, the, the test teacher are testing, try to, to keep the information uh, space uh, closed and say you have to be tested on this, that, that, that. So you have to only worry about these things that I'm going to ask you in the exams. Then uh, there is a standardization as the norm. As the one size fits all. This has been the norm of the educational system. So uh, this is not defined by teachers. It's defined by the way the system is, uh, is managed. We look for efficiency. That means reducing cost and uh, reaching uh, as many as people as possible with the less resources. And in the end, we have a big, in the overall, we have a behaviorist approach because we, give, uh, we teach. Uh, I don't care about what happens in your mind, and then I'm going to, uh, to ask you if you, have, uh, you are providing the, the expected results. I think that this is the, the, what you said about how knowledge is uh, produced, teaching is uh, transmission, learning and reception, and so on. I mean, that's uh, the very same idea. So, to arrive to the, to the point I wanted to say, uh, the current way educational relationships are structured, it is not, it is not a law of nature. It is a human decision, a set of large, uh, large number of human decisions, which are a product of tradition, the faculty, the economy, and of mainly of managerial convenience. Huh? And this, uh, I, think, uh, I think that today, they do not respond very well to the intrinsic requirements of learning and educating. So, for instance, the, the high number of dropouts you have in this country and in other countries is in part uh, a big result of the managerial way uh, education is structured. Maybe with other ways of organizing things, we could retain the students in the schools doing uh, a much better, a much better. So let me use an authority. This man is a man has a Japanese consultant that wrote it, uh, 200 books about management. He's a very important person. This, uh, he wrote this book, The Mind of the Strategies, in 1982. For me, it was a really discover Intellectual discovered in this book, and he said a very simple phrase: uh, "A business reflects its manager. Mm? Uh, yes. The business of education reflects the managers of education, uh, not reflect the teachers. Reflects the managers of education, their values, their ideas, the way they see the world. Mm? Mm? And teachers are just instruments of delivering this, the, their views. Uh, I think that." Uh, the concepts, the methods, the, the values of the people who organize the systems, the, 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 the way the, they allocate resources at what define uh, uh, schooling today. Not the willingness of teachers, not the preparation or training of teachers. Obviously, this is, has an influence. But nevertheless, uh, the, the, the idea is that things are decided at another level. At this level, uh, is the, the one who implies that teachers and learners have to perform uh, in some specific ways. And which are, this, in my opinion, some uh, common features of this managerial mindset? They focus on the school, the closed domain in which they are in control, disregarding home and community. I think one of the educational problems, the biggest educational problem, is the lack of continuity between community and schools. So schools, schools have the, the definite walls which put uh, our world <laughs> outside. So uh, this is a result of the, the way education is managed. And also, uh, the management involves, uh, embodies a culture of imposing goals and contributed to its perpetuation. So, and I think that is a self-defeating strategy because we see that the real learning is not happening in the level it should happen. So uh, the, the idea of imposing continuously goals to students is uh, giving, uh, in general terms, uh, very bad uh, results. Some more features of this managerial mindset, uh, mindset, they think within the limits of the current evaluation and supervision and control systems. So there is very scarce uh, out-of-the-box thinking. Managers have to manage the way that, 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 that's uh, being prescribed. Uh, and they are very comfortable with this because they have clear ideas of how to ac give account of their general uh, activity. Uh, because of the thing is very straightforward, is very um, between uh, um, closed uh, boundaries, uh, for them is quite managed because giving certain numbers or certain indicator and the quantitative data is the way that they ensure that their work is of, of quality. 
Managers are much more focused on doing things better than on doing better things. And when I say doing better things, I see the things that could deliver uh, more valuable outcomes. This is so. We are trying to improve inside the, 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 the box, with the current thinking, not doing other things. Because the system, as it is managed, doesn't allow for all of that. But I'm not going to make this examination. No, this is not possible. You have to examine your students in that way, at that time, so the way it is prescribed. You cannot do other things. And finally, the managers feel accountable to the top and to the media. <laughs> Let's say it this way. They do not feel accountable to the people that are, the people that are under uh, their jurisdiction. So this is a real uh, problem because uh, they have to produce figures saying that the management of the system is as good as possible according to this uh, uh, external criteria, not internal criteria. Now, at this point, I would like to, uh, to introduce this lady, which uh, was a Harvard professor in the business school. And she, uh, uh, for me, is a, uh, one of his book, her books is a bedside book that I have on uh, the table. Uh, it's uh, a six or seven minute video. I think I have time to, to, uh, to, to show you. Please, when you hear uh, the, this lady, when she talks about uh, wealth creation, thing learning. Mm -hmm. The issue in my mind is that it, we're not talking about a, a single flaw or a series of flaws. When we talk about management today, we're talking about a system that was designed a hundred years ago for a specific purpose in mind, and that was um, the low cost, therefore the efficient and the standardized production of goods that would be affordable for a new world of mass consumers. And that's, we created the management system to be able to oversee the complexity and the coordination demands of this kind of system. Well, so here we are a hundred years later, and the system still works very, very well for producing low-cost goods for mass consumers. The problem is that society has moved on. And people today, largely because of the success of this system in the 20th century, people today no longer experience themselves as anonymous mass consumers. They're no longer content to be uh, the, the, the other side of an adversarial anonymous transaction. People today have become more complex more educated, more informed, more traveled, more experienced, and so their needs have shifted. So when we talk about people either in, in their role as the purchasers of goods and services, consumers, or in their role as workers, employees, we're talking about people who are fundamentally different from those of a hundred years ago. And yet it was a hundred years ago that the model was built. So the, the problem, rather than a, a design flaw, the problem is a, syst a system that has grown out of touch with the society around it, the people that it should be serving, the people who must depend upon it for employment and for consumption. Because obviously in a modern society, we don't, most of us don't grow our own food or make our own clothes. We have to be consumers and we depend on these institutions for all the things that most intimately affect our lives and our ability to take care of our families, you know, for our health, for education, for housing, for, for finance, as well as for all the kinds of goods that, that we need on a daily basis. So how do, how do we address this problem? How, how does this problem evolve? Uh, historically, what has happened is that um, capitalism, because the system that we're talking about in the 20th century began with mass production, but ultimately became the, the foundation for a whole century of capitalism that came to be known as managerial capitalism because we created the management system to, to coordinate the complexity of this kind of new undertaking. So man, man, managerial capitalism is only one chapter in the history of capitalism. Before that, there was proprietary capitalism, and before that, there was mercantile capitalism. And these 
chapters of capitalism shift and evolve with changing populations and with changing technological capabilities. Yeah. And so as they shift and evolve, they emerge with new logics, new business models, new commercial frameworks. So how are we going to get from where we are to where we need to be? Right now we have lots of uh, people, both in their roles as consumers and as employees, whose needs for control over their lives, to live life the way they want to live it, uh, to, to have choice in the way they conduct their lives, to have voice, to be connected, uh, to feel, uh, to have support, to, to get through the complexity of modern life. These needs on the part of individuals are largely going not only unfulfilled, but unnoticed. They don't get on the radar screen. So the, the, the big challenge for us now as business people is how do we realign our commercial operations with these new needs? And it's very hard to do that from inside the old model because the old model was created to keep consumers out. Those are extrinsic factors that we keep on the outside so they don't mess up our ability to be efficient and standardized and so on. So it's very difficult from within the current management system to reach out and realign with the needs of these new populations. However, when you see companies, entities that are actually doing it, you see enormous growth and success and enormous release of economic value. Look at a few examples. iPod and iTunes. We have a traditional music industry that says, no, we keep music inside our industry and you're only allowed to get it the way we want you to get it. You have to come to a record shop, you have to buy a CD, right? And then we have people over here saying, no, 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 we want music the way we want it. We don't want to buy your CD. We want individual tunes. We want to compile our own CDs. We want to trade it. We want to get it from friends. We want to get it directly. And the two are at war. And then along comes the team at Apple and between iPod, a device, but iTunes, a new configuration of assets, right? We take music from inside the old model. We migrated it over to the listeners, the people who really want it, and we reunite those. So now we've taken those assets and we've realigned them with their real end users. And as everybody knows, Apple, iPod, iTunes is one of the great successes of the early 21st century because it's an example of this kind of realignment. And what it did was release so much economic value. iPod and iTunes make so much money while those record shops are, are closing, right? And the old sources of revenue for the mu music industry were dying out. So this is tremendously hopeful and tremendously exciting because what it shows us is that there is so much economic value sitting in the new subjective needs of people that aren't on the radar screen of the traditional system. And when we hone in on those and figure out how to reconfigure to meet those needs, masses of wealth are created. And to me, that's one of the exciting challenges of the next century. Trey. Maybe it's a little bit long, but I think that it settles the, it's the, the scenario Sets a, sets a scenario for the, the problem of management we are having today, which is, is not a particularly uh, an educational problem. It's a problem that uh, it's, uh, affects... The managerial problems affect all areas of our life. In economics, for instance, in economics, we have managerial problems that obviously affect what, uh, what our lives. So the problem is uh, going, as she said, from where we are to where we, we need to be. And this uh, can only be done uh, if we proceed to a new reconfiguration of assets, of the things we have in the system. And the learning in, in the end, or learning with technological means, should be the way to reconfigure educational assets, to deliver it in other ways, uh, and very much more flexible, much more oriented to the specific needs of the people. So. 
This is the, the, in summary, this is his message. Now we need a new logic based on the, on the individual. And besides the, 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 the learning as an industry which works well for certain areas, in general for the population and for the schools and the universities, we need a new logic and this new logic has to be defined by the in a substantial part by the by new concepts and by the use of technology. So obviously we need managers and I don't know to explain who they mean is, but it's a very important person and said it's manager responsibility to look ahead, to predict, to change the product. So if we do not have managers who are really in tune uh, with, uh, with teachers in order to look ahead to predict and to change the product, we will continue our situation in which teachers are working a lot in order to improve things, but without substantial gains, substantial changes in the other part, which is really influencing the way they deliver. This is my message. Thank you. Thank you.